Welcome. This is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And this is Exploration. Every week on Exploration, we discuss the fascinating world of science and its impact on society. And today, once again, we're going to answer some of the emails that I get. And first of all, I apologize to those people whose emails I cannot personally answer. I simply get too many of them. However, as a consequence, I like to answer them in groups. And here are some of the questions that have been coming in for the new year. First of all, the weather. The weather seems to be going berserk with the polar vortex. So first of all, what is the polar vortex anyway? And what's the relationship to the greenhouse effect, if any? And one question I get is, well, many people are too embarrassed to admit it, but what is the greenhouse effect anyway? And how does it come about? And then, of course, I get a whole bunch of emails concerning Donald Trump. And the question is, well, his cabinet apparently is going to be full of oil executives and conservatives. And so basically, we're going to have the oil industry running Trump's government. And the question is, what does that mean for solar and wind and renewables? The good news and the bad news. And you'd be surprised to realize that much of the momentum that's been generated over the last decade is in some sense irreversible. And then let's say a few things about outer space. Well, doomsayers, of course, love to predict the end of the world, and 2017 is no exception. Sure enough, some people are saying that this fall, watch for it, Planet X. Planet S is going to come barreling into their solar system and destroy the Earth. Well, actually, there is evidence of a gigantic planet out there the size of Neptune, way beyond the orbit of Pluto. And is that Planet X, or is that just wishful thinking of Woodbury prophets? And then speaking about outer space, Mars has been getting a lot of news lately. In fact, NASA has officially stated that Mars will be the goal. We should also point out that Elon Musk, who is spearheading SpaceX, has his own plan to actually beat NASA to go to Mars and not to be outdone. Boeing. Boeing Aircraft is the third, third major organization to say that they're going to set their sights to Mars. So what does that mean? Also, for those of you that have been following all the news in cyberspace, you realize that some companies are now offering, in some sense, a piece of Digital immortality. And so we'll say a few things about immortality, both digital as well as biological. In other words, with all the advances that we've made in biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and computers, the question is, first of all, is it possible that we can digitally store everything there is known about us, animate it using artificial intelligence, so that we, in some sense, live forever? And for that matter, what about the biology of immortality? If you've been following the health news, you realize that a number of very tantalizing genes have been uncovered. We still don't yet have the fountain of youth. But hey, it's well within the laws of physics and biology that one day we may be able to stop and hey, who knows, perhaps even reverse the aging process. And so we'll summarize what is known and not known about digital and biological immortality. Well, once again, let's usher in a new year. However, let's face it, 2016 went down as the hottest year, hottest year ever recorded in the history of science, topping 2015 in 2014, which in turn were also the hottest year ever recorded in the history of science in the past. Now, the question is, why do we have, therefore, a freeze in much of the United States with the polar vortex? It seems to violate common sense. If the Earth is getting hotter and hotter, how come areas like Chicago seem to be frozen solid? Well, the answer is very simple. It turns out that at the North Pole and the South Pole, there is a hurricane, a gigantic hurricane that's called the polar vortex. 
Usually it's quite stable, and therefore it does not really affect the jet stream, and we really don't see much effects from the polar vortex. However, recently, the stability of the polar vortex has been called into question. Basically, it's wobbling. And as it wobbles, it begins to collide with the jet stream and alter its path, sending the jet stream barreling down into America, into even areas of Florida, where we have record snowfalls in areas that usually don't have any snowfalls at all. So then the next question is, what is causing the wobbling of this polar vortex, which is usually quite stable? Well, the short answer is there's no unanimity among climatologists. However, there is a theory that says that it could be global warming. Now, how's that? How can global warming affect the wobbling of the polar vortex? Well, quite simple. The stability of the polar vortex depends on the difference in temperature and pressure between the inside and the outside of the polar vortex. It turns out that when there's a very large temperature gap and large pressure gap, that causes winds to be quite ferocious and be stable. And as a consequence, the polar vortex does not wander very much when we have a large gap between the temperature on the inside, pressure on the inside, and the pressure and temperature on the outside. Well, with global warming, we know that the North Pole is heating up. Heating up quite dramatically. In fact, the polar ice has been thinned by 50% in the last 50 years since we've been visiting the North Pole with our nuclear submarines. 50% decrease in the last 50 years. That's amazing. 1% per year, meaning that some of us will live to see when there is no North Polar region at all. Now, this means that the gap in temperature and pressure between the inside and the outside is lessening. As a consequence, that causes the winds to be less ferocious surrounding the polar vortex, causing it to wobble. And even though computer simulations seem to indicate that that's what's happening, there's no unanimity yet among climatologists. So in other words, the leading theory is that it is global warming. It's not accepted by everybody yet. But the fact that the gap between the inside and the outside of the polar vortex in terms of temperature and pressure has been lessening because of global warming seems to indicate that, yes, it is global warming that is causing the polar vortex to wander over the American Midwest as the jet stream goes bananas. So then the next question is, well, we've heard a lot about global warming and greenhouse effect, but quite a few of you out there are quite embarrassed to admit that you really don't know why there is a greenhouse effect. I mean, what is the science behind the greenhouse effect? Well, we've all seen greenhouses. Greenhouses, even in the middle of winter, can be quite warm, even though outside things could be frozen. You also know that if you leave a dog, for example, in your car in summertime, you have to be very mindful of the dog because it's going to heat up. The inside of the car is going to heat up. Why is that? Because glass can trap sunlight. Here's how it works. Ordinary visible light from the sun can go right through glass. Glass is invisible when it comes to sunlight. However, when sunlight then hits the upholstery of your car or the inside of a greenhouse, it loses energy. It turns to infrared radiation. So it goes from visible light, losing energy, to infrared light. That is heat radiation. But infrared does not go through glass very well. So in other words, what goes in does not necessarily go out. And so the greenhouse effect is sort of like a roach motel. Sunlight checks in, but infrared does not check out. Therefore, the inside of your car heats up in summertime. It also means that if you have a greenhouse, you can have warm temperatures inside a greenhouse in the middle of winter without heating your greenhouse at all. And it also means that the earth itself is heating up. Now, 
we know more or less the temperature of the Earth going back almost a million years. Now, you may say to yourself, well, how do we know that, smarty pants? I mean, no one was around a million years ago. Humans have only been around about 100,000 years. So how do we know what the weather was like, and how do we calibrate carbon dioxide and the temperature of the Earth? Well, many ways to do it. The chief way is to use ice cores. That is, you drill right into the ice, and you pull out ice that has basically fallen as snow hundreds of thousands of years ago. Many years ago, I had a chance to visit Iceland, and the scientists at the university there took me on a tour of their ice core vault. When you open the door of the vault, it's quite cold inside there, but inside the vault you see these long poles containing ice that basically was formed hundreds of thousands of years ago. Now you create these poles of ice by drilling, drilling right into the ice and pulling out the ice that is quite ancient. And then when you open up the poles, when you open these long rods, what you find is layers of soot, stripes basically. Each stripe in turn corresponds to volcanic ash that in principle was laid down, for example, by volcanoes. Since we know the date of these volcanic eruptions quite well, we can actually date the ice cores this way. Quite amazing. And so there are very different ways in which you can actually see the age at which the ice was laid down, going back to about 600,000 to a million years. What we find is quite revealing. We find that the carbon dioxide level and the temperature go up and down together like a roller coaster, a pair of roller coasters. So in other words, when the carbon dioxide level goes up, temperature goes up as well. And from this, we can actually see some rather interesting phenomena. We realize that the temperature of the Earth is rather unstable. That is, 10,000 years ago, we had the end of the last ice age, and temperatures have been more or less heating up for the last 10,000 years since the end of the last glaciation. However, however, in the last 50 to 100 years, there's been a spike, a rise that cannot be explained by the normal ebbs and flows of the weather. And that's where human intervention comes in. In fact, computer modeling verifies this. If you take a look at computer models, and you inject more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the temperature rises. In fact, if you insert the amount of carbon dioxide that's been sent into the atmosphere because of the Industrial Revolution, you find an exact correlation. So you can actually, quote, predict the past. That is, we know what it was, we know what the temperatures were like after the Industrial Revolution, and in a computer program, we can artificially put in, in the last 100 years, an excess of carbon dioxide, and bingo! We get a rise in temperature that matches, matches the current spike in the rise of the temperature. So almost all climatologists would say that, yes, without question, everybody believes that the climate is warming up. There is global warming. Now, the debate may arise on the question of what drives it. But among scientists with 90% confidence, with 90% confidence, scientists believe that it is human intervention that is causing the recent rise in temperature, which is not part of the rise in temperature since the end of the last ice age. Now, then the next question is, well, what is Donald Trump going to do about this? Well, if you look at the picks for the cabinet, you may basically roll your eyes into the heavens and say, whoops, well, I guess the oil companies will be controlling environmental policy for the United States. Well, yes and no. Some climatologists are saying that the momentum built up in the last 10 years, some of it cannot be stopped even by the president of the United States. Now, here's the reason why. First of all, economics. We have many states of the Union which have bet on solar and wind, 
And that momentum is not going to suddenly change just because there is a new president of the United States. Second, the technical aspect of solar and wind is also changing. The simple question is, why don't we have solar and wind competitive with oil? Well, one of the chief reasons is not what you think. It's not the efficiency of solar cells and so on and so forth. One of the main bottlenecks preventing the mass production of large amounts of solar and wind power is storage. That is the battery. You have a problem when the sun doesn't shine and the wind don't blow. You simply don't generate much electricity at all. And also the utilities have a problem because they have to match peak summer and peak winter demand. That means that utilities have to spend more money creating excess capacity so that come peak summer and peak winter, they're able to meet the demand of the consumer. Now, the bottleneck is storage, that is the battery. We need a cheap battery. That can supply energy when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow and you're not at peak summer and peak winter. The good news is, finally, after a 100 years of negligence, inventor after inventor, company after company, are investing millions of dollars to increase the power, efficiency, and storage of your battery. A hundred years ago, Thomas Edison and Henry Ford were rivals and friends. They actually took vacations together, and they made a bet. What would energize the future? Henry Ford, of course, bet on oil and gas, and Henry Ford bet on the battery. Well, we all know who won the bet. It was Henry Ford. But some people are saying that maybe the last laugh belongs to the descendants of Thomas Edison. Because now, with so many inventors and corporations dumping resources into the battery, we're beginning to see that battery prices are dropping at around 7% a year. That's astronomical. In other words, batteries of the future are going to be cheaper and more efficient and may be able to meet the demands of solar and wind enthusiasts and states which are betting on solar and wind. In fact, Elon Musk, of SpaceX and Tesla Motors is betting on it. He set up a special division to produce a super battery, a super battery that can, in fact, make solar and wind power economical so that you can store the energy for times when the sun doesn't shine and winds don't blow, and utilities can store electricity so that they don't have to meet peak summer and peak winter demand. And so the good news is that a tremendous amount of momentum has been generated. And many people believe that the main bottleneck to solar and wind power was not basically the uh, bungling of an administration, but the bottleneck was storage. And that storage, we think, can be solved in the coming years. Also, let's say a few things about outer space. If you've been following the Internet news, you know that, well, once again, people are predicting doomsday for 2017. Sometime in fall, say some doomsayers, the planet X, Nibiru, is going to come barreling into the solar system and devastate the planet. Well, is there any truth to planet X? Well, first of all, let me say that scientists scanning the heavens have, in fact, found evidence of a gigantic planet orbiting the sun way beyond the orbit of Pluto. We don't have direct observation of this planet. It's done by computers. By looking at Newton's laws of gravity and charting the motion of asteroids and planets, we can see that there's something out there that is jiggling the motion of heavenly bodies inside our solar system. For example, that's how we discovered Neptune. Astronomers, when they looked at the planet Uranus, realized that, well, urine has wobbled a bit, and it shouldn't have wobbled. Does that mean that Isaac Newton's laws of motion are incorrect? No. Astronomers said that they believe in Newton so much that they use Newton's laws to calculate, calculate an object that was, in fact, perturbing the orbit of Uranus. And bingo, on the first try, 
on the first try, they found the planet Neptune. Now it turns out that once again, we see a jiggling in the planets and asteroid motions. So therefore, there is something out there that is perturbing the, the orbits. That's why some people say there is a new planet out there. However, we do not have direct observation of this planet, so we can't say for sure that it's out there. However, most astronomers that have looked at the mathematics believes that it's convincing that there could be a large planet, not pluto size, but neptune size. In other words, a gas giant, a little bit smaller than the planet Saturn, that could be orbiting the Earth. Now, is that Nibiru, the 10th planet that's going to destroy the Earth in 2017? No. Because once again, looking at Newton's laws of motion, we can see that the orbit of this planet would take it around the solar system on a scale of thousands of years. And so in other words, right now it's way out there in outer space, and it's not going to even come close to the Earth for perhaps tens of thousands of years. So you don't have to worry that Doomsday is just around the corner in 2017. And speaking about outer space, Mars once again is in the news. Almost every day, somebody is making a statement, making a claim. Now even the United Arab Emirates of the Middle East, they want to go to Mars too. They certainly have the cash, and they're building not a manned rocket, but they're building a satellite, a probe that they hope will be sent to Mars. Even a small nation like the United Arab Emirates is being fascinated by the question of Mars. Well, United States, not one, not two, but three groups have announced that they are going to Mars. First, we have NASA. NASA is already perfecting the SLS booster rocket, perhaps one of the biggest booster rockets of its type, bigger than the Saturn rocket, which took us to the moon back in 1969. And they also have salvaged the Orion space module from the replacement for the space shuttle. So once again, they have the booster rocket, the SLS. They have the module, which you can put on top of the SLS. And bingo, in principle, you could have a Mars rocket. So NASA has laid out a three-part program, as we've mentioned before, on exploration. Part one is to test the SLS and the Orion module separately and perhaps send it on a maiden mission. In step two, NASA is going to go to the moon with the SLS booster and the Orion space module as a practice run and perhaps even land on an asteroid in segment two. In the third segment of the plan, NASA then is going to go all the way to Mars, perhaps a moon of Mars first, because Mars has two small moons, which act like a space station around Mars. And of course, the mission to Mars would be quite dangerous. It would take uh, nine months to get to Mars, and then a few months to do scientific observations, and another nine months to come back. That's a two-year voyage. But the world's record for a human living under weightless conditions is just a little over a year. And so we're going to test the limits of space endurance with this mission. Not to be outdone, Elon Musk of SpaceX has announced that he wants to modify the Falcon rocket and he wants to go to the moon starting next year. In 2018, SpaceX will probably launch an unmanned mission to Mars just to show it can be done. And then Elon Musk is thinking big. Eventually, he wants to have a fleet of Mars rockets, a thousand of them, each rocket in turn containing perhaps a thousand space colonists to create the first city on Mars. So he's not even waiting for NASA to land one person on Mars. He's already envisioning a city on Mars with a population of about a million. And not to be outdone, Boeing Aircraft has jumped into the game. They, too, are saying that they are building a rocket capable of going all the way to Mars. Well, as we said many times in exploration, uh, I wish them well, but there are lots of hazards that have to be negotiated. The first is, of course, weightlessness that has tremendous deleterious effects on the human body. 
basically your bones weaken, you lose valuable minerals, and uh, you basically lose muscle mass so that by the time you land on Mars, you can barely crawl out of your space capsule. Then, of course, there's radiation out there. There's the Van Allen radiation belt. Our astronauts did go through the Van Allen belt when they went to the moon. But hey, going to the moon is a piece of cake. Three days tops. Three days you're on the moon. Mars is a two-year mission. And so there's quite a bit of difference between going to Mars and going to the moon. Not to mention the dangers of space travel. About 1% of the time, we have catastrophic booster rocket failure in our space missions. We forget that. We see so many successful launches, we forget that about 1% of these launches end up in catastrophic failure. The space shuttle mission, for example, logged roughly 200 missions. And how many fatal accidents did they have? Two. Once again, a 1% failure rate. And so we can go on and on. There are quite a few hazards to going to Mars. But hey, let's face it, there are volunteers. There are people who, in fact, would volunteer for a one-way mission to Mars, which I think defies common sense. But yes, there are some people that say that, yeah, they want to go to Mars. And speaking about lifespan, let me say a few things about immortality, digital immortality and biologic immortality. Well, you know, years ago, scientists would simply roll their eyes whenever someone mentioned the fountain of youth or reversing the aging process or immortality in any shape or form. Not anymore. We realize that billions of dollars, not thousands, not millions, but billions of dollars will be allocated and are being allocated for aspects of understanding the aging process and essentially creating immortality. Already, some companies have advertised a digital form of immortality. They're going to take your digital footprint. That is everything that is digitally known about you your credit card transactions, the kinds of restaurants you go to, the moves you buy, all of your Amazon statements, not to mention YouTube videos and tape recordings, everything. And use artificial intelligence to homogenize it, smooth it out, and create a crude version of you. <laughs> That's right. So in other words, in the future, when you go to the library, there'll be a separate section of the library for souls, a library of souls. So, for example, wouldn't it be great to go to the library and talk to Winston Churchill? Not read a biography of Winston Churchill, but actually talk to the guy. That is, with today's technology, we can assemble all the videotapes, all the transactions, everything known about Winston Churchill to create a holographic image that, of course, is a little bit cartoonish, but a holographic image that can talk to you. In fact, maybe one day your great-grandkids will go to the library and have a conversation with you because you left a very large digital footprint by which we can calculate your favorite wines, your favorite books, where you like to travel, and some of the memories, perhaps, that you had after we interview some of your friends about your personality and incidences and stories about your life. Well, we can't do that yet, but already entrepreneurs are offering a way to collect your digital footprint, and perhaps one day we'll create a library of souls. Further down the line, there's a Connectome project, a billion-dollar project. We're talking big bucks now. A billion-dollar project to map the entire human brain down to the neurons. And so we have a complete duplicate of your brain all the way down to brain cells. Welcome. Once again, this is Dr. Michio Kaku, Professor of Theoretical Physics at the City College and the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And this is the second half of Exploration. In the first part of Exploration, we summarize some of the top stories in science. And in the second part of exploration, we'll talk about the aging process. 
Our special guest today is Dr. Jay Olshansky, one of the world's leading authorities on the aging process, author of the book, The Quest for Immortality. And we're going to try to separate the hype from the reality of what's happening inside the universities and learning centers of the world. Now, of course, the search for immortality is not a new one. In fact, one of the oldest texts of all time, predating the Bible, is the Tales of Gilgamesh. In fact, many of the passages from the Tales of Gilgamesh were later incorporated into the Bible. And what was Gilgamesh doing? Well, it turns out that he was searching for the Fountain of Youth. And so the search for Fountain of Youth is an old one, dating all the way back to prehistory. Not to mention the fact that in Asian folklore, Emperor Qin was the first emperor to unify China in around the year 200 BC. However, even though he could conquer as far as the eye could see, he could not conquer the wrinkles on his face. He was getting old. And so, to conquer the aging process, he assembled all his princes and explorers, and he gave them a mission. Go out and find the Fountain of Youth, or don't come back. Well, obviously they did not find the Fountain of Youth, because Emperor Chen did in fact die. However, since they couldn't come back, perhaps the princes and explorers of Emperor Chen went on to found Korea and Japan. Not to mention the fact that Ponce de Leon was searching for the Fountain of Youth, and instead he found the great state of Florida. So it's an old dream, but it's a dream that has drawbacks. First of all, we have not found anything resembling the Fountain of Youth, but we also have Greek mythology. And in Greek mythology, we have the legend of Eos, the goddess of the dawn. Well, goddesses, of course, are immortal, but she had the misfortune of falling in love with a mortal, Tithonus. And so she pleaded with Zeus, the father of all the gods, to give the gift of immortality to her lover. Well, Zeus took pity on the goddess of the dawn, and so he granted her wish. And in fact, Tithonus became immortal. However, Eos made a big mistake, a huge mistake. She forgot to ask for the gift of eternal youth as well. And so her lover simply got older and older and older, but could never die. That was his fate. And so people who search for immortality also have to wonder, will we suffer the fate of Tithonus? If we start to live forever, will we live forever in decaying, dying bodies that cannot die? Well, now we have genetic engineering, and now we have a much deeper understanding of the molecular biology of the aging process. And so with us today is Dr. Jay Olshansky, who will talk to us today about why do we have to get old? And now I'd like to bring on our special guest for today. We're very delighted to have with us Professor S.J. Olshansky. He's a professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and he's also a research institute at the Center on Aging at the University of Chicago. Well, if you've been to the drugstore, you've probably been hit with all these advertising saying that you can retard the aging process, even roll back the hands of time, live longer, they say. But what about the truth? The truth about human growth hormone, antioxidants, massive doses of vitamins and minerals and herbs and supplements. What about the hardcore truth and scientific verification of these claims? And also, what about genetics? We seem to be teasing apart many of the genes that influence the aging process. So once again, we're going to bring on our special guest today, Professor Jay Olshansky, and he's the co-author of a book called The Quest for Immortality. So that's the subject of today's discussion, immortality. Now, I understand that today you and other prominent scientists have issued a, a policy statement, a recommendation of sorts that could have 
serious uh, and beneficial economic benefits. Uh, could you elaborate? Yes. Uh, this is uh, based on an article we published in The Scientist back in March of uh, this year uh, with Rich Miller from the University of Michigan, uh, Dan Perry from the Alliance for Aging Research, and Bob Butler from the International Longevity Center in New York. And we basically uh, suggested that the time has arrived for uh, societies, uh, not just the United States, but really all nations, to begin investing in an effort to slow the biological process of aging in people. Uh, and the logic and the rationale is fairly straightforward. Uh, basically, what we're suggesting is, is that a, even a small uh, deceleration or slowdown in the rate of biological aging uh, of just a few years would actually yield huge economic and health benefits. Um, I mean, think of it this way. The way the NIH is currently set up is essentially to d deal with one disease at a time independent of all others. But if you can find a way to slow down the biological process of aging, you would essentially postpone everything that is negative associated with growing older into later and later ages. It would be, uh, even, it would be as if you you achieved a major discovery for every major fatal and non-fatal disease if you could find a way to slow aging. So we're calling on Congress to begin investing in a concerted effort to slow the biological process of aging in, in people. Yes, in fact, the social benefits could be astronomical, especially as you look at the baby boomers that are hitting 60 and will eventually uh, increase medical costs uh, tremendously in this country. Yes. I mean, the prevalence of, uh, of conditions of frailty and disability will rise dramatically in the coming decades with the aging of the baby boom cohort. Uh, so slowing that process even a little bit would actually uh, enable people to be uh, healthier longer, uh, contribute uh, to the economy longer. They would just, uh, just everything positive. Uh, associated with um, with uh, with aging, there are positive things associated with aging. Would uh, be extended, uh, so it would be it would be uh, an an extraordinarily important uh, event for national economies, for public health. Uh, I, it really, the time has arrived, I think. And not only has the time arrived, but the science is approaching the level at which I think we're beginning to gain enough understanding that we think we can do this in humans. We know we can do it in other animals. Um, we think we can do this in humans. Okay, now let's get back to Earth and uh, talk about hokum, snake oil, and real science. Uh, if you visit the drugstore, you realize that there are whole shelves full of herbs and remedies and vitamins making all sorts of promises about retarding the aging process, reversing the years. So let's now talk about the science, that is, what is known experimentally. Let's start with the Internet, where we have lots of advertisements for human growth hormone. Now, in some sense, are the people of America being used as guinea pigs for this gigantic experiment on human growth hormone, or what are your thoughts? Well, uh, actually... Uh, people are using themselves as guinea pigs. It's absolutely remarkable that, uh, you know, you can go on the Internet and find every conceivable nutritional supplement and hormone, including growth hormone, uh, with people with no expertise in the field claiming that it can slow, stop, or reverse the biological process of aging. And people believe this. They spend enormous sums of money. They order this stuff over the Internet. They inject themselves with it or take these pills. And there isn't a shred of, shred of evidence that it'll make you live any longer. There actually is some evidence, some suggestive evidence, that some of these substances, including growth hormone, have the potential to actually shorten your life. Uh, so it's remarkable that people are conducting a biological experiment on themselves. It doesn't mean that there isn't value necessarily to some nutritional supplements, particularly for people who are deficient in certain vitamins and minerals. Uh, there's no question that there is a benefit for those individuals. But if your diet is so bad that you're deficient in some major uh, vitamin or mineral or, uh, you know, or, or something, um, that uh, these, uh, these vitamin supplements aren't going to uh, make up the difference. It simply isn't going to work. And there's no evidence that it actually extends life. 
And what about the side effects of human growth hormones? Some people think maybe cancer or other kinds of diseases associated with accelerating metabolism. Uh, it's like a sports car. If you were to accelerate a sports car, you throw off a few gears here, here and there. And that, of course, means cancer, because cancer, in some sense, is genetic errors. Uh, but what are your thoughts about side effects of human growth hormone? Well, um, first of all, uh, it has been demonstrated that there are some benefits, believe it or not, uh, associated with growth hormone, including increased muscle mass and uh, reduction in the rate of bone loss and improved skin elasticity. So you can't deny the fact that there have been benefits associated with it. But accompanying those benefits have been uh, risks, including carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, increased risk of diabetes. There is suggestive evidence that it might increase the risk of cancer. The fact is, is that it hasn't been properly studied yet using clinical trials in humans. Uh, and so before those clinical trials are in, before we know what the results are, it's really premature to be using these kinds of substances. And again, once again, with the case of growth hormone, there isn't any evidence that it extends life. Okay, now moving on, when you go to the drugstore, you see these advertisements for megavitamins. Uh, some claim that it retards uh, the oxidation process. Other people cite certain studies which show that if you ingest certain diets, diets are rich in vitamins, it seems to be good for you. But what about the pure, the pure form of vitamins that you buy in the drugstore? Well, um, well, once again, um, you know, the, the nutritional supplement uh, industry is really working hard to convince us that aging is somehow caused by... Uh, uh, either the loss of some hormone or the lack of nutritional supplements of one kind or another, and they're perfectly willing to sell you uh, everything that that, uh, that that they can to try to convince you that you can somehow influence this process. Uh, and it's based in part on a uh, on, on on science, uh, where it's suggested that uh, par that aging is influenced by oxidation, uh, and this oxidation process can be. Uh, uh, slow down in theory with the ingestion of uh, certain nutritional supplements that have antioxidative effects. Um, but there isn't any empirical evidence that demonstrates that these substances actually extend duration of life. Uh, so once again, it's the same scenario uh, where people are selling something with exaggerated claims uh, with a profit motive uh, in mind, and uh, people are buying it up like crazy. And what about herbs? Some people say that maybe pure vitamins that are refined by the chemical companies may not uh, simulate uh, vitamins in the natural forms. So what about taking herbal medicines? What is known or not known about herbs? Now, honest, honestly, I don't, I don't know that much about her, uh, herbs and herbal medicines um, to comment uh, on that. But what I can tell you is, is, that, is that there's plenty of evidence that eating more fruits and vegetables and uh, can certainly in, uh, l lower your risk of a wide variety of diseases and disorders. Uh, and of course, those in the supplement is industry are suggesting that contained within those fruits and vegetables, there are certain substances that they can concentrate in a pill and give to you in a larger form, you know, under the assumption that more is better. Well, there is where the evidence is lacking. There, the evidence is there that eating more fruits and vegetables is good for you, the evidence is lacking with the nutritional supplements containing the vitamins that they think are causing the beneficial effect. Uh, the evidence there is lacking that that will have any significant effect. Okay, now moving on, let's talk about something that actually does work. Uh, I think all scientists would say unanimously that there is one and only one proven way, in the animal kingdom anyway, of actually increasing the lifespan of animals. We don't know whether it works for humans yet. But let's talk about caloric restriction. First of all, what is it? And uh, what tests have been done? Well, this you're right. This is the uh, one intervention that's been demonstrated repeatedly to extend duration of life on a wide variety of species. Uh, it's basically reducing your caloric intake. It can, you know, vary. The percentage can vary from anywhere from 10 to 30 percent below maintenance levels. Um, so it would depend on what your current uh, height and weight is. But you know, if your normal caloric intake is uh, 
2,000 calories to maintain your weight, you might be reducing it down to 15, for example, 1,500 uh, calories. Um, and, the, and no one exactly knows uh, why it works or how it works, the underlying mechanism, but there is consistent research suggesting that it extends duration of life. Now, the question is, how does it do so? Does it extend duration of life by slowing the biological process of aging? Some people believe that to be the case. Others suggest that it actually extends duration of life by reducing the risk of a wide variety of diseases and disorders, which is not the same as slowing the biological process of aging. Um, remember, if you reduce the risk of uh, heart disease, cancer, and stroke, however you do that through exercise or diet, the aging process marches on. It's uninfluenced by that. Um, but if indeed you're slowing down the biological process of aging, then everything negative associated with it is dragged to later ages. It's postponed to later ages. And that would actually be a wonderful thing if caloric restriction was the mechanism that actually uh, worked. Now, don't expect, by the way, that people are going to be living longer by reducing, dramatically reducing their caloric intake. What the scientists are looking for is the underlying mechanism find a way to mimic that process without actually reducing your caloric intake. It should be obvious, by the way, that in the United States and elsewhere, we're doing the exact opposite. We are increasing our caloric intake. We are growing more obese at a more rapid pace um, than we ever have in the past. So this research is particularly important and is interesting for a wide variety of reasons. Okay, now caloric restriction works on yeast cells, uh, spiders, insects, uh, mice, and now for the first time we're getting the first preliminary evidence uh, from primate studies done in Bethesda, Maryland. So can you tell us a little bit about some of those experiments, because primates, of course, are closer to us, and uh, perhaps it may work on organisms as complex as us. But what are your thoughts? Well, my guess is it probably will. I mean, the work of Richard Weinrich from uh, Wisconsin and other researchers uh, at NIH and Bethesda uh, have, I think, demonstrated quite convincingly that reducing caloric intake can lower the risk of disease. Probably it will extend duration of life. We have to wait for these animals to live long enough to determine whether or not uh, that's going to be one of the consequences. But there's there are a couple of problems here. In the, some of the earlier studies, you need to remember that the control animals that were used in the caloric restriction studies were fed ad libitum, uh, meaning they had as much food as they wanted, which is sort of like us. Uh, and so whenever you reduce your caloric intake uh, relative to eating as much as you want, what you are demonstrating is more the uh, detrimental effect of a gluttonous lifestyle rather than the longevity-enhancing effect of caloric restriction. So you have to be careful on, on how you interpret that. Now, in more recent studies, the control animals are not fed ad libitum. They are, are fed really more of a maintenance diet. Um, and you're not seeing quite the large uh, differences in uh, duration of life in these two populations when you do it that way. Nevertheless, you do see reductions in the risk of uh, a wide variety of diseases and disorders, and we would all be better off if we reduced our caloric intake. Whether it would work in humans at the level that we see in the, these other species, I think is highly questionable. And there's a real concern when, uh, for example, you extend the duration of life of a fruit fly or, uh, or a roundworm nematode by three, four, or five-fold. Real, it's real tempting for researchers to then multiply the human life expectancy by three, four, or five and suggest that the same effect if it occurred in humans would make us live hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, my guess is we wouldn't see anywhere near that kind of uh, magnitude, uh, increase in magnitude and duration of life in humans. But if we could, you know, live healthier longer for just, you know, an extra five or ten years, that would be huge. Okay, now I understand that the animals that have been studied uh, seem to be a little bit lethargic uh, because they have such a restricted diet. They have less cancerous tumors, uh, less incidences of diseases associated with the aging process, but they also seem to lack an interest in the sex drive. That is, all the things that uh, make uh, life worth living, joie de vivre, uh, these animals seem to be pretty lethargic. Uh, is that true? Yeah, so I understand that there is a, appears to be a price 
uh, to pay, there appears to be uh, lower fecundity, um, less interest in uh, sex, and I think a difficult problem with controlling body temperature. Uh, these animals uh, are cold, in fact, uh, feel cold. And in fact, in the case of humans who are conducting this experiment on themselves, they're essentially reporting the same thing. Um, so there is a price, at least for now, to be paid by adopting this calorically restricted uh, diet, which is why, as I said earlier, re reducing your caloric intake to these kinds of levels probably isn't the way it's going to work in humans. The way it's probably going to work in humans is that scientists will try to find some sort of mimetic, something that will uh, fool the body into believing that it's cal calorically restricted to achieve the same effect. Uh, without actually reducing significantly reducing your caloric intake like that, and that's probably uh, the way it will work. And, and that's it's extremely valuable and interesting uh, research that needs to be aggressively uh, pursued because there's such great potential there. Okay, now let's leave the animal kingdom and talk and talk strictly about humans. Uh, in your book, you mention the fact that the uh, life expectancy for Americans at the beginning of the 20th century was not very long at all, less than 50 years of age. And yet there's been an increase uh, into the 70s uh, since then. Some people think it's sanitation, other people think it's antibiotics and vaccines. But what are your thoughts about looking at the long-term, the long-term life expectancy of humans going back to ancient days, uh, through the Middle Ages, uh, to the turn of the century, to present-day times? Well, going back to, to ancient times, uh, there's evidence to suggest that life expectancy, for example, during the time of the uh, ancient Egyptians, was probably somewhere in the 20s. Nobody knows exactly where it was, but it's likely to have been in the 20s. Uh, we've, we achieved a very small incremental increase over uh, the millennia to the beginning of the 20th, uh, uh, the beginning of the, the 19th and 20th centuries, when life expectancy rose up to about uh, between 45 and 50, uh, in the United States anyway. Um, and then you saw this quantum leap in life expectancy during the 20th century from uh, you know, 50 to close to 80. And that was largely attributable to dramatic reductions in early age mortality, infant, child, and maternal mortality, principally as a result of uh, sanitation, uh, public health, refrigeration, uh, foods, and so forth. It's, you know, the introduction of antibiotics uh, occurred after most of the declines in the death rate uh, occurred at younger ages and contributed relatively uh, a small amount to the rise in life expectancy in the 20th century. Now, in the latter part of the 20th century, there have been notable reductions in death rates at middle and older ages, even from heart disease, from some forms of cancer. Um, and so you, you see you know, two forces contributing during the 20th century. The early age mortality declines at the beginning, and the later age mortality declines at the end, uh, which explains by the way, why the more recent increases in expectancy have been smaller than the ones that occurred at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century. When you save children from dying, you add very rapidly to life expectancy. When you save middle-aged and older people from dying uh, from uh, fatal diseases, chronic fatal diseases, you add rel a relatively smaller amount. Now, it turns out that Japanese women have some of the longest life expectancies on the planet Earth. Uh, it's almost approaching 90. So we're talking about 50% uh, of Japanese women uh, essentially getting into their late 80s and into their 90s. Some people say it's diet, a fish diet that's low in fat. But uh, what are your thoughts about the demographics of different societies? Well, first of all, for, the, for Japanese women, it's just above 85 might it be approaching 86. And, mm -hmm. and you have to realize that, that um, there's a huge difference between 85 and 90. It's not the same as between 50 and 55. Uh, and the reason is fairly straight, straightforward. Um, you know, to raise life expectancy up when you're at these very high levels is extremely difficult because you're, you know, you're pushing up against uh, the basic biological process of aging itself. 
There's no question that subgroups of the population, such as those in Okinawa, Japan, for example, have, have much higher life expectancies. The actual force involved is, is not yet understood. Um, it's not like we can, here in the U.S., adopt the lifestyle of the Japanese. I know some people have suggested this, including some friends of mine um, who study the, the Okinawa diet, uh, suggested that you can somehow get Americans to live as long as the Okinawans by, have, by adopting this particular lifestyle. And there's no evidence to suggest that that would be the case, unless, of course, we were all Japanese here in the United States, and that isn't the case. Um, you know, there are genetic factors that are influencing uh, uh, the risk of death and, and, uh, and duration of life, and those are things that we simply cannot control, um, uh, at least not yet, anyway. Uh, but there's no question that subgroups of the population do experience greater longevity than other subgroups, and that is a fascinating area to study, by the way, because it would appear as though there are genes that exist within the human genome that influence duration of life and they may be more highly concentrated in some subgroups relative to others. Okay, now let's talk about genes because that's of course where most of the breakthroughs are being made in the last few years. Again, there's no fountain of youth, uh, no, in, no one in the genetics area is claiming to have solved the aging process, but there's been lots of very interesting studies. Uh, first of all, there's something called progeria a genetic disease that's been intensely studied in which children, children die of old age. Uh, they look like plucked chickens and they die of heart attacks as teenagers. Uh, could you elaborate on that very strange disease? Well, it appears on this, progeria appears on the surface anyway to be a phenomenon of accelerated aging, uh, but there's evidence to suggest it is not. There are lots of things that don't occur. Uh, in these uh, children that occur in the aging phenotype of, of uh, individuals who a actually do make it out to, to older ages. So I would be cautious about, uh, about thinking of progeria as accelerated uh, aging. Um, it is certainly interesting to study these individuals, and you have to realize that it's always easy to do something to yourself that will accelerate aging. I mean, you know, we've, and we do it all the time, quite frankly. And one of my, uh, the arguments that I've made for many years is, is that the only control we have over the duration of our life is to shorten it. And we exercise that control all the time when we adopt lifestyles that are, uh, you know, where we expose ourselves to the sun or we don't exercise or we smoke cigarettes or, or use drugs. These are the kinds of things that can uh, make us die at much younger ages than would otherwise be the case. Well, unfortunately, our time is up. Once again, you've been listening to an interview with Dr. Jay Olshansky, author of the book, The Quest for Immortality. And if you want a copy of today's program, call the Pacifica Program Service at 1-800-735-0230. Once again, for a copy of today's program, call the Pacifica Program Service at 1-800-735-0230. Once again, this is Dr. Michio Kaku for Exploration. Join us every week when we discuss the cutting edge of science and how it impacts on society. Good day.